Go ahead. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to Charleston Antique Mall, located here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I wanted to um, first make a little announcement. If everyone could please turn off their cell phones so we don't interrupt the class. I have to do my And the next thing I want to talk about is our past classes are all up on YouTube. Every class we do, we record, and we put them yeah. up on our YouTube channel. So please go check those out. Our next class is going to be next month, September 10th on a Sunday. It's going to be on glass identification. We're going to go through depression to modern glass and how to identify different brands and things like that. So we hope you guys can check that one out. Um, lastly, in the back and in the front of the store, we have something called the Country and Antique Register. These are great informational tools. They tell you different antique malls, different events going on in the city. So if you guys can, go ahead and check those out. They're free in almost every antique mall. Once again, thank you so much for joining us here. I'm going to turn this over to dealer number seven, Maria, our expert in vintage jewelry. Thank you and have a great day. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. I didn't anticipate it's going to be you know, this, this many people. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Steve for, you know, giving me an opportunity to be hosting this class. My name is Maria. Uh, I am one of the dealer here. My dealer is over there, number seven, if you want to check later. <laughs> um, basically, I'm going to conduct this class. Uh, this is going to be an informative class about how to identify vintage jewelry, how to um, identify it from costume, and fine jewelry. Uh, so it's, it's a basic class for people that doesn't even know what jewelry is. Uh, and a little background about me is I acquired uh, my diploma in uh, applied jewelry prof professional from uh, GIA. And I also work uh, part time here and part time at a uh, local uh, fine jewelry uh, store over at the uh, strip. So I will try to share information as much as I could. And um, before we start, does anybody know what is considered vintage um, jewelry? What is the specification or definition of vintage jewelry? Anybody? Older than 50 years. Yes, I know. So uh, basically, according to the website definition, anything vintage will be considered over 20 or 25 years. So 50 is yes, correct. It's part of the uh, condition of being vintage. Uh, so it should be somewhere between 25 years and older from the manufactured date. And pieces could be from precious metal uh, or base metal, which we're going to talk about that later, uh, with different kind of stone or other materials. And how about antique jewelry? Does anybody know how old antique normally? Over 100. So anything over 100 will be considered antique jewelry. And another one is it, antique jewelry also the same. So it could be from precious metal or base metal with uh, precious stone or just any other materials. And last one is the estate jewelry. Anybody know what estate jewelry is? Yes, previ previously owned by anybody or uh, in, the, in the jewelry industry, it will be better if it's owned by some, someone famous. For example, I, I can have a bangle like this, but th if this is owned by me, the value is probably just a melting value. But if it's owned by uh, Jennifer Lopez, of course, it will increase the value and the provenance as well. So the second one that we're going through is costume uh, versus fine jewelry. Uh, we're going to start with the fine jewelry. So anything that consider fine jewelry is anything that made from precious metal. Uh, in this case, the common metals that we use is gold, solid gold, uh, silver, platinum, and, um, and those three. This type of three metals considered precious metal. Um, do, you, do you guys know how to identify? Let's say you got a piece from your grandma or your mom, and you're like, how do I define this? How do I know which one is gold-plated, which one is precious gold? Look for the mark. Look for the mark. So, so the mark in gold normally comes in carrot, but it's not the carrot of the C, because when it's C, a carrot, normally it goes for a diamond. So for a gold pieces, you want to take a look at pieces. I have a piece of uh, necklace right here. This one is solid gold. Now, before we go to mark or identify any gold, 
you need some tools to, to start identifying. You need a loop like this. You can get this from eBay or Amazon. And you need also a magnet. So any precious metal, it shouldn't be magnetic. So if you see something like this, this is a rope chain. It looks like gold, right? But if you put a magnet and the magnet stays, then this is a false alarm. This is one thing that you have to like aware, oh, this is not gold or silver. Because real silver, like this one, this will not attach to any magnet. And second you wanna see is the mark. So you need a loop. And I've seen this a lot. Some people look at the loop like this. You will not look any mark with this. You have to put close to your dominant eye. In this case, is my right eye. And you have to like look for the mark like that. And then you will see uh, if it's like 10 carat. I put it right here. Uh, they have 9 carat, 10 carat, 14, 18, 22, 21, 23, and 24. Now, uh, like, what if I see a numbers? You know, sometimes in, in gold, you'll see numbers. Like, what is 417? So basically, there is a formulation for a gold. Uh, if you can take out your calculator. So anything like 14 carat, for example, will be identified with 14 K or 585. Now, how do I know that number? Is it just I make it up? Of course not. There's a formulation to it. So if you take out your calculator, you might, uh, basically gold is divided by thousand parts. So to come out with the number 585 or 14 carat, you just add 14 and divided by 24 times 1,000. There, there you go. You got your 583 uh, uh, parts. So if you uh, have a piece of old pieces and you might think, oh, maybe this is gold. Just take out your loop and you look at the number. If that says 14 carat, that's great. And if it says 585, that's also great. That's a good indicator that it's a real gold. Now, uh, we also have like gold plated, right? It looks like gold, feels like gold, but it's not gold because as I told you, it's very magnetic. The way to look at it is to look at it with the loop and see any mark. If it says GF, that means it's a gold field. If it say GP, that means it's gold plated. And everybody was like, uh, what is gold plated? Anybody knows what gold plated is? It's a thin part of gold over metal. Yep, so it's basically one of the process to make a costume or imitation. And the way they do it, they can do it with a roll, uh, a thin, finely thin uh, sheets of uh, gold paper where they heat it up and you can have a gold plated. Or the other one is gold filled. Gold field is way better imitation than uh, gold plated because gold field has thickness way more than the gold plated. But if you ask me what's the value, it's nothing because it's just plated. If you wear it uh, uh, every day, you take it to the shower, you, you do ev everything with it, it will tarnish. So value wise, there's nothing to it because underneath that metal, it's just a base metal. It could be uh, stainless steel, it could be copper, it could be brass. So there is no really monetary value to it. So in this case, solid gold is the winner. Uh, any questions so far? Yes. If your jewelry is in uh, brass or uh, some other you know, old uh, metal, does that have any value these days? I mean, it's a vintage stuff. I've got a lot of stuff from my mother-in-law that uh, she used to wear. So we'll go to the cost of jewelry, how to identify costume. Is it worth anything or not? But right now I'm going with the precious metal. Now the second one that you guys normally see, there's a lot of uh, fine jewelry also made out of silver. Now how to identify silver is basically the same concept with gold. First you need your loop and also you need your magnet. This is very, very important. If anything attracted to magnet, then it's, it's probably not silver because silver, gold, and platinum, they are a type of metal that is not attracted to magnet. It could be slightly magnetic because when they coat, especially the clasp, 
the class has to be really strong in order uh, for a piece of jewelry to uh, be durable. So that might be coated with something that could attract to magnet. But if it's too magnetic like this, this is no brainer. This is fake. And uh, these days, there's a lot of uh, pieces of jewelry that says 925 or 14K. But you can't really tell if it's real or not unless you do specific tests. And one of the tests you can do is with acid. And also you can acquire that from eBay or Amazon. And the way you do it is very easy. Basically, you just take a piece of your metal, scratch it over the stone, and pour the acid itself. If it's uh, silver, it will leave like a really red tint or liquid to it. And if it's just plain uh, color of the tester, then it's fake. To, to, to save so. What kind of acid are you talking about? It's a special acid that they use for different kinds of precious metal. So when you purchase, they will have a different kind of acid. Yeah. You can find it easily on eBay or Amazon. And you're not putting that on your jewelry, you're putting it on the stone. No, you, you have to scratch a little bit of your uh, jewelry over the stone and you pour that acid over the stone, not on your jewelry. Right. Because if it's real, I mean, if it's real, what happened is they're probably just going to be, uh, 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 it won't change anything. You just have to wipe and polish it. But if it's fake, it will ruin the metal. So that's what happened. And uh, mark in silver, normally, as you all know, it's 925. I mean, it's sterling. And for old pieces, you will see um, 900 or 800. Things that 800 mark, uh, they normally comes from Germany or other European countries. So it's considered older pieces. Yeah, and also uh, there is a lot of pieces that is not marked. Uh, for example, the Native American sterling, they tend to be, they don't have a mark or anything, but they're actually sterling. So the only way to test it is with the acid. Or uh, the other indicator for uh, real silver is they don't have odor. So they're odorless. Unlike, you know, like some metal, you have sometimes you touch a lot of uh, different kinds of metals and you smell your fingers. It has like specific smell to it. Silver and gold, they have no odor at all. So they're odorless. Yeah. Any questions so far? If not, we're going to, uh, we're going to move on with platinum. Uh, platinum is another uh, precious metal that very popular uh, during the Edwardian era, which is the early 1900s, because back then people are super wealthy after the, uh, the, you know, the transition from the late uh, 1900, uh, 1800 to 1900. So a lot of jewelry, you will see them set in platinum, diamonds, and uh, also um, gold. So exception for uh, silver from, or any pieces, precious metals from the UK. Normally, if you see any uh, old pieces from your mom or your grandma and you see uh, there's a lot of markings, for example, you see a uh, lion passant uh, is basically uh, uh, comes from UK or England because in England, the marking has a different level of it. They have uh, normally four markings that states from where they located, what office, what city, what carrot, and uh, what date. So that's another different uh, way to identify that your piece is maybe not from US, but from the UK. Uh, and fine jewelry, normally they use a precious stone. Anybody know what can be qualified as precious stone, maybe? Diamonds, ruby, sapphire, and we ha also have a semi-precious stone, consider topaz, uh, jade, Chrysophrite, yeah, garnet, that will also consider semi precious stone. And uh, we're moving to custom jewelry. So the most common. Backup cash yes. is the front, please. Thank you. On, uh, for platinum jewelry, are there markings like the case yes. or anything like that for it? Thank you. I forgot to mention that. So for a platinum, you will see a lot of marking like PL or PLAT. And normally it's marked with the number 950. If you see 950, it could be either sterling, uh, silver, or platinum. 
But normally platinum, they have a really strict regulations. So they will put plat and the number 950. Yeah. And for gold, uh, we go back to gold. So this is the, the sample of solid gold. This is 14 karat. It's not magnetized, as you can see. And I also have 24 karat gold. So if you see the luster from 14 karat and 24, the yellowness of it is really different. Like 24, it's really, really yellow, really high luster. And the 14 is slightly pale. But in terms of durability, 14 karat is way stronger. Because sometimes uh, when you uh, have jewelry with 14 karat, you mix the other base of your gold with other metal. It could be zinc, copper, nickel, silver. And yeah. So 14 is the lowest amount of gold, 24 would be the highest amount of gold in the There is no really high and low amount. Uh, in the older uh, period of uh, gold, we even find a brooch or any piece of jewelry that's made from six karat uh, gold. That means the, con the, the content of gold is really, really low. And the mixed metal alloy, it could be zinc, copper, silver, it's higher. So uh, uh, normally these days, especially in the United States, uh, we, we rarely find anything that 9 carat or uh, 6 carat. The standard in the United States is 10 or 14. And other countries is higher because I, I, sometimes when I go overseas, I buy, I purchase some of gold, and that's how I can get my 22 carat gold. In the United States, you can never find 22 carat because they're awfully soft. They're very, very uh, bendable. Uh, but in terms of value, obviously the higher carrot is the better. Yeah. When it comes to like the chain itself, I mean, would, would there be any kind of markings on there if it's a gold chain? I mean, where would you look for it? So what you want to look for it is the marking. Again, it, they will say 14K with the, with the K, kilo, not C. And then sometimes you will find also not 14K, but 585. That means also 14 karat. Yeah. Yep. If it's like gold plated, you'll see like 14 K GP. That means it's gold plated. Or you will see uh, 12 K GF. And then there is a 120th. The 120th is actually the material of the, uh, uh, the, the gold uh, thin uh, sheets that they have to uh, fill it. So it's based on the metal weight as well. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Any more question about precious metal? Okay. So now we're going to a costume jewelry. Now costume jewelry is more common in the antique mall because it's fun, it's flirty, it's you know, it's it's uh it's playful. You can wear it anytime, anywhere for any event you want. Uh, the most common for materials for uh, costume jewelry it will be metal. Pot metal. Pot metal is basically a bunch of metal that you just melt them in the low heat and you, you know, it's become a base metal. Uh, older pieces, they use brass, uh, some silver, uh, gold plated, gold filled, uh, plastic, wood, etc. And many stones in costume jewelry is normally glass. Unfortunately, it's not some sort of precious stone. Uh, plastic or uh, lab grown or imitation stones and how to identify my costume jewelry so if you have any pieces old how do I define it that's what we're going to talk about in this class uh, I'm going to uh, divide them based on the time period so the first one is the Victorian Victorian jewelry Victorian jewelry is basically from 1837 the reign of Queen Victoria until the 1901 and uh, that's how they gained the name. Uh, during Victorian uh, era, there is a lot of jewelry that influenced from Etruscan, Roman, Greek, and also Gothic. Some of the pieces I can show you right here. This is from Victorian. You can tell it's very Gothic. Used a lot of uh, gold and onyx. This one right here. If you want to see later on, you can also do that. Another Victorian pieces that I have right now. 
is this necklace right here. It's pr pretty much just base metal, nothing special. Uh, and they, the, the kaboshong pieces right here, the, the stone, they most likely made out of glass. So it's really not uh, something that uh, special, but because it's older, it's vintage, I mean, it's antique, it's more than 100 years old, people appreciate uh, the beauty of it because you can't really find any stuff like this anymore anywhere else. It has to be at the antique mall or you know any kind of thrift, other thrift shop. So during the time of Victorian, if you see any uh, precious uh, fine jewelry, they tend to be in lower carat, as I told earlier. They tend to be in, they're using nine carat or 10 carat. Uh, the 18 carat is possible, but it, probably somewhere in the museum right now. So we don't have it anymore outside the market. Or if, even if we do, it's going to be really, really expensive. Another Victorian pieces that I was telling you about is this brooch right here. This one is sterling, uh, probably late, uh, mid to late Victorian. So 1850 above. And uh, uh, the way we can identify that this is Victorian is you can see based on the model they're using a lot of filigree back then with the granulation beads. That's one of indication is from Victorian. Also the clasp at the back, if you see the clasp right here, it's like a C clasp. This one typically is handmade, so nothing back then is made uh, machine made or, or factory made. So everything is completely hand hammered. And uh, also if you see the needle, it tend to poke outside. Like, I don't know if you can see it right there. This was made because of the thickness of the Victorian clothing back then. They used, you know, layers and layers of clothes. So this, this was made for a reason, not just because it's for fun or to poke you. Uh, and also they tend to make uh, the metal of the needle is slightly heavier than the regular class this day because it's meant to be for the, the heavier textile. So if you want to see later on, this is one of the pieces from uh, Victorian. Another one that common is the morning jewelry. You had it before, I saw it. It's basically, uh, you know, during that time when people uh, passed away or they gone for war, uh, they created a jewelry made out of uh, that person's hair. I know it sounds gross, but <laughs> that's, that's normal back then. So they tend to uh, braid it and they make a locket out of it or they make a brooch that they can wear anytime they want or a pendant locket with the necklace. So it's very common. I don't have the pictures right now, but I try to. Yeah, I don't have that right now, but I know that you have one earlier, so I might use that for a sample. Right. Thank you so much. So, I've never seen one in real because it's just, I don't know, I can't get over that it's a human's hair. <laughs> But this is one of the pieces right here. It's a locket. If you see inside here, there's a human hair that was braided inside. This is called morning jewelry. Very common during uh, uh, Victorian era, especially the, the late Victorian, because at the time, I think Queen Victoria mourning the death of her uh, husband, and it's very popular during that time. Uh, again, you can, you can tell from the clasp at the, bottom, uh, the back. It's like a tube hinge. You can tell it's bent because it's man-made and the clasp is, is gone. <laughs> so, but you can still use it as a pendant. It's old. Yeah, it's very, very old. It's more than 100 years old. So thank you so much. Another Victorian that I found that uh, interesting as well is this one right here. Oh, do you have the Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Oh, right here. This is also another uh, Victorian piece brooch. This is actually for sale if you want to buy later on. <laughs> you can tell from the clasp 
It's very old. It's a C clasp where people just insert it, and it's slightly longer, so it poke your finger, and it's not marked, but you can tell from the design. Can you describe the design? The design is a, it's like a rope chain where they intertwine it. Oh. Yeah, and they put enamel on it. Enameling also very common back for a late Victorian. So this is one piece that uh, consider Victorian era. Another yes. uh, question during that era, what is jet exactly? So jet is basically a common material that people use. It's basically fossilized uh, wood. Yeah, uh, fossilized, uh, uh, yeah, coal or wood. Uh, it, if you look at it with the naked eye, it looks like onyx. But the, the difference is, is one, uh, it's light, it's very light. And if you scratch it on a piece of paper, you will see a tinted black on it. Oh. Onyx doesn't do that. Onyx is basically a uh, dye quartz. So onyx is slightly heavy and cold. You can feel it on your hand. Yeah. Uh, jet is one of the material that very common as well during the Victorian era. And they also have a cameo. Cameo, you know, like a, this cameo, this is reproduction, this is not from Victorian, but I'm just showing this kind of cameo is very, very common during uh, Victorian era. Yeah, so people love cameo, uh, jet, and there is another uh, common material called gut, gutta percha, it's G-U-T-A, yeah, it, gutta percha. It's basically a uh, kind of like a robbery material that they used to tint it their jewelry. So if you see a blacken on Victorian uh, design, then it's probably made out of gutta percha. And that's what the dentist uses when you get a look Yes, the yep, exactly. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, any questions about Victorian era or period? Otherwise, we're going to jump on to uh, Edwardian. Say again. Do you have any questions about Victorian? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> well, if not, we're going to jump a little uh, further to uh, Edwardian era or period. So uh, during this time, basically Edwardian is from the, the name of uh, Queen Victoria's son, Edward VII. Uh, and uh, during this period is the, the, the period of wealth. Uh, so uh, it starts uh, the beginning of 1900 to 1915. Also during this era in UK, you call it Edwardian, in France, they call it La Belle Epoque, or Beauty Era. It's the same period, they're overlapping. Uh, so you will see a lot of uh, uh, material uh, design that's similar to it. It's just different names. Uh, so during this time, uh, platinum, again, I mentioned that earlier, precious metal were heavily used. So if you see anything, Anything that uh, looks like a flower wreath or garland, laurel wreath, uh, like that, it probably from the Edwardian. I have the sample right here. This is very ornate, heavily used of diamonds because you know many rich people back then, so they use it a lot in their jewelry. I have one set, a couple sample here. This is my personal collection. This one is made out of silver. It's marked uh, sterling. And if you see this, the design right here, use a lot of wreath. This piece is garnet. It's semi-precious stone. And you can see a lot of flower design with the, the garland. Very beautiful, very voluptuous, very, a lot of uh, lines. So that's one of the indication this piece is from Edwardian period. I also have a pair of earrings that from Edwardian, very chandelier type, very dainty. You see here, right, very ornate, very laborious time to make this. And these all done with handmade. They don't use any machine, no mass produced like these days products. So this is the one. This one? What kind of metal are they? This is sterling. And are they marked? Yeah, they're marked. They have a mark uh, in the back right here, say sterling, which is Sterling also common use of precious metal before 1940s, because after that they start using 925. Yeah. This is another um, 
Edwardian piece right here too. This is chandelier crystal, very ornate, very nature looks like, beautiful, you know. That's why they call it La Belle Epoque, just beauty, beauty era. Any questions about this period? It's very short period. It's only 15 years. So there's not much to, uh, to tell about the, the different items because they normally just 15 years and they use a lot of precious metals. So, yes? Uh, not necessary. Uh, again, uh, anything antiques. It could be a high value if you see uh, what are they made. If they made from precious uh, metal, like gold, silver, it will definitely raise the value. So you have to take consideration of who owned it before, what's the origin of it. Yeah. Otherwise, it'll be just uh, somewhere in the mid uh, range of price. Yeah. So it's not too special unless it's oh it's uh, by designer so and so and it's owned by so and so. Then yeah, the price could be like. At the Christie uh, auction house. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they uh, the people make imitation jewelry since the beginning of the era, seven seven thousand years ago. They they make imitation of everything. So in each period, yeah, they have anything that made with precious metal. But of course, there's a lot of people also make the imitation of it. And fun fact. Actually, uh, the term of costume jewelry is just started at 1930s, the beginning of 1930s, and is uh, coined by Gabrielle Coco Chanel. You ever heard her? That's the one that coined the costume term costume jewelry, because then she started making a lot of uh, per, uh, faux pearls and all this costume jewelry. Before that, everybody calls imitation jewelry, because it's imitate the real one. Okay, and if there's no questions, I'm gonna move to the next period. It's called Art Nouveau. It's my favorite era, period. Uh, it's basically overlapping with Edwardian. It's from 1890 until 1914, or beginning 1920s. Uh, so during this period, a lot of uh, jewelry, it will be uh, using a lot of flowy lines and enameling, it's beautiful. It's, it's uh, popularized by Rene Lalique. You've heard Lalique, right? You think, oh, Lalique is the sculpture, you know, the frosted glass. Little to know that he was actually uh, start his journey as a jeweler. And he was the one who uh, rediscovered the usage of enamel called plique azure. It's basically an enamel without the back, uh, backing plate. So when you put it on the sunlight, the sunlight will go through the enamel or the paint. One of the uh, René Lalique creation is this beautiful, beautiful necklace. So in, during this era, you will see a lot of, uh, they, they embrace women. They embrace the curvaceous of women. They embrace the fantastical myth creatures and flowers and nature. Uh, so you'll see a lot of uh, dragonfly, butterfly, dragon mixed with women, naked women out of nowhere. So you'll see a lot uh, of Art Nouveau uh, era uh, with the design like that. This one right here, uh, the usage of opal uh, is heavily used. Opal, diamonds, uh, and enameling, amethyst, uh, and uh, ruby and also sapphire. So here you'll see a woman, a naked woman pretty much, with the wing of swan, and then you have uh, amethyst and diamond. This is really intricate. And it's got peacocks over on the next Exactly, a lot of uh, peacocks, swan, any, any beautiful animals pretty much used heavily during Art uh, Nouveau area, period. And uh, I have some pieces from Art Nouveau Right here, this is the sample of it. So you'll see a lot of uh, voluptuous line, intertwined lines. You won't see anything that uh, square or triangle is not happening on uh, during Art Nouveau. It's, it's all about volume. This is one piece right here. This is uh, Sterling, Art Nouveau, early 1900. Uh, another Art Nouveau piece I have 
is right here. This is imitation. There's no precious metal in here. It's used uh, base metal to make this beautiful necklace. And this is only glass. But you can tell from the, the, the design on the side, they're using enamel and the design is flower. So it's very accentuated, very embracing natures. So that's a heavy indication that pieces from Art Nouveau right here. Very old, very beautiful. Uh, enamel is basically one of the technique used in jewelry uh, where you pour uh, a powder glass and you melt it and then you seal it. So basically enamel happened. Now in the case of Art Nouveau period, uh, the, the plaque azure is another technique, but uh, the, the, the differences with enamel is they don't put the backing of it. So the backing is completely open work. So open work means there is no plate to cover it. That way when you put it on the, uh, against the sun rays, the sun rays, the light comes in and you can, it's kind of like when you go to church and you see the stained glass and the lights can come in. That's exactly plique azure techniques. It's another technique of enameling. Another technique of enameling is guilloche uh, enamel. It's right here. They make a lot of guilloche enamel during uh, early 1900. This is one of the pieces uh, of guilloche right here. It's basically the same thing. You put a piece of metal and then you start making wavy patterns with the uh, paint, the powdered glass, and you seal it. That's what the guilloche means right here. You can see it close later on if you want. It's very delicate, very beautiful. It's uh, popular in France, and the name obviously comes from France as well. Um, another, this one also from Art uh, Nouveau period, right here. This is same thing, filigree, bows, uh, uh, beautiful, uh, ornate, but the backing is the indicator that this is from the newer, uh, so it's not Victorian. It's not uh, Edwardian, but this is from the Art Nouveau. It's very pretty. It's uh, sterling silver. And these are all handmade still? This is all still handmade, yeah. There is no machine made until later, Art Deco. Yeah, so everything that you see is all handmade by love <laughs> or for money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other techniques during the early... 1900 or, or late 1800 is called repousse. Repousse means you have a piece of metal that you bang in and out so you can create a, a high relief uh, brooch like this. This is very famous uh, technique, very old. So it's from one piece of metal? Uh, no, this one is soldered together. Oh, okay. But the, the backing, you can see the backing is etch uh, with a hand hammered and also the front one right here. This is also old piece. This is German right here. And this is actually uh, not silver or sterling. This is uh, what they call alpaca. So alpaca is another metal that they make the mixture of metal to mimic sterling, but it's not sterling. In terms of value, if you see it on eBay or uh, thrift shop or antiques, um, they will say alpaca, but it actually has really no value. If you trade in for silver, they will not take it because it's just a metal than mimicking silver. It's not really silver, if that makes sense. Would you spell that for me? The alpaca uh -huh. is A-L-P-A-C-A. -A -A. Oh, just like the... It's like the animal. Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, what other pieces I can show you? There's so many of them. Oh, this one right here. This is Art Nouveau. This is another Art Nouveau piece. They use a lot of uh, voluptuous line. They don't use any geometric, not yet. Uh, this is sterling, a fair male. Another term is fair male. Fair male is basically gold plated or gold deep. And the base layer has to be sterling or silver. This one right here, if you want to see this one. 
uh, use uh, glass, blue glass, and underneath is silver. It's just dipped in gold. It's marked sterling, so that's a good indication that your piece is old. If it's nine, anything 925, uh, after nine, 1930s or 40s, they, they start using 925 a lot. But before that, they tend to use sterling. And this is another Victorian pieces that I forgot to show you. You can see from the clasp. This is probably uh, late uh, 1800. It used spring clasp. This is one of the oldest uh, clasps that they create. And you can tell from the design, it used a lot of granulated beads with filigrees. This is unmarked, but I tested this is silver. Uh, this one also from Art Nouveau. This is early 1900. This is a beautiful piece. So this is a, a pretty much a cameo bracelet that they made using a mother of pearl. And this is called a seven days bracelet because there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. It's a Greek goddess, which they, they tend to use a lot uh, for a Roman revival or Greek revival. They use this a lot. So uh, the class, it's actually, this is replacement, it's broken, but this is pretty old. It's, it's made with 800 silver, and this is from Italy, right here. This one, if you see it online, they stretch to 90 to 150 max. So, any more questions about Art Nouveau? If not, we're going to move to Art Deco. <laughs> The next period will be art deco jewelry. Uh, it's basically emerged after the World War I, um, and it's popular until the end of 1930s. Now, during this piece, uh, during this area or period, uh, because uh, they use a lot of metal for war, so pot metal, base metal, platinum, they take it away, they, they keep it, they preserve it, and they change it to a lot of gold and silver. So during Art Deco, you will see a lot of uh, pieces that heavily use uh, silver and gold. Um, and it's very easy to recognize uh, Art Deco period because it's geometry. Anything that trapezoid, triangle, uh, something like this, this is very uh, structured. This is from Art Deco right here. This is indicate uh, that this is from Art Deco period. This one is again glass that they make to mimic uh, amber or citrine. Uh, you can tell also from the clasp, it's still using the old one, the spring clasp. This one is Art Deco. And also this one right here is Art Deco. You can see a lot of triangles, a lot of rectangular, very bold, very geometric. You won't see any more flowing like Art Nouveau anymore. It's transition to more bold and uh, very uh, strong, strong color too. They use a lot of strong colors. Um, another Art Deco piece that is beautiful, they use a lot of filigree. So filigree is back on, on game. So this is another Art Deco right here. They, uh, during Art Deco, they also take a lot of influence from uh, Egyptian revival because the Tutankhamun tomb founded in 1922 or 1929. So a lot of uh, pieces, they use uh, heavy uh, influence from Egyptian. One of the sample is this one right here. This is purely costume. There's nothing special about this. It's by, and it's unmarked too. But this one is by designer called Selro. Uh, and they use a lot of you know, Egyptian uh, resin uh, on this, or celluloid they call it. How is the designer? Uh, Selro. S E L R O. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, because of the Chinese export starts to emerge, you will see a lot of pieces also from Art Deco that have a lot of cloisonne, like this. This is one of the older pieces. Uh, they're using brass as their base metal, and then the cloisonne right here. Uh, you still use using uh, they still use a lot of um, butterfly nature, but they concentrate on uh, bold uh, and strong geometric uh, patterns for Art Deco. 
Um, another Art Deco piece is this one right here. This is also a uh, imitation of uh, Cartier, one of the Cartier pieces. It's called the Nautilus style because it, it mimicking shells. A lot of uh, diamonds used during Art Deco, they cut it in baguette. And does anybody know baguette cut? It's like a little yes, it's like a little square or rectangular, like this one right here. They use a lot of rubies, sapphire, diamonds. You'll see a lot of uh, uh, sterling and onyx. Onyx is heavily used during Art Deco. One of them is right here. Where was it? <laughs> this one is uh, Art Deco. They use a lot of uh, Kemper glass. Kemper glass is basically glass that they injected with fluid to make it frosted. They, so if you see something like that, that's also Art Deco. But beware, there's a lot of uh, uh, reproduction and there's a lot of uh, fakes. Uh, one of the newest uh, brand, it's called 1928. If you see 1928, it's uh, reproduction. It's basically something that they created to uh, Art Deco revival. But most of the pieces made late uh, 1990s or early 2000. It's, it's not Art Deco. But a lot of their design, if you look uh, and you don't really know what's going on, you think it's Art Deco, but if you see the tag, it says 1928. You can see also with the backing, the finishing, it's not. It's just reproduction. The real Art Deco, they will have an intricate uh, design. You see the back, the backing, right? It's very geometric. Even the back, they, they put pattern on it. Because uh, during, I think during, uh, during that era, uh, there is a lot of uh, new arts like Cubism came out, which is very structured, very bold, very geometric. And that's also reflected in the jewelry. You'll see a lot of uh, uh, two ladies, two Egyptian ladies covering with the wings. This is one of the design right here. Yeah. And also during Art Deco, if you get the imitation of it, they use a lot of uh, glass crystal chandelier type like this. But again, the usage of onyx is heavy. So you will see a lot of... Uh, Jewelry with uh, onyx and silver or onyx and uh, sterling. That's also indicate that could be your pieces from Art Deco. This one right here, another piece of Art Deco. They use a lot of glass, very bold, uh, very uh, pattern geometric. Uh, you can tell from the, uh, the design over here. They don't use anything flowy. They use anything bold, symmetrical. This is also Art Deco. Any questions about Art Deco? Yes? Yes, Marcasite also heavily used during Art Deco. And Marcasite is basically just another... Oh. Just another uh, kind of uh, stones that they use for uh, jewelry. So if you see Marcasite like this, this is good. <laughs> this is Art Deco too. Yeah, and see the baguette cu uh, cut? Even though it's glass, this is also Art Deco. Okay, and next one we move to retro, to modern. So after the World War II done, uh, there are a lot of designers starts coming out. In the United States, uh, maybe you've heard tri Trifari, Coro, Hobe. That's all from the about 1930s to 1940s and, and some of them uh, they still have you can still see the design until now some of them they closed down their factory in the 1980s or 1990s now we're talking about uh pieces that unmarked but worth a lot in my opinion i call them holy trinity <laughs> so these three brand is something that on uh, some of them mark some of them unmarked but can stretch a really high value uh, one of them is juliana I don't know if you ever heard Juliana. If you see any Juliana pieces, most of them is not marked. So there's no mark to it. But there is, uh, I have the pieces right here. This is my prized possession right here. This is by Juliana. This one, if you see it, is not marked at all. Uh, the company was started in 1940s. Uh, and then they uh, make a lot of jewelry for uh, opera production. So it's very, uh, very bling blingy, but it's unmarked. There is a couple ways to identify this. Unfortunately, we have a short time. 
So I'm just going to show you later. We have the book as well. And the second brand is Miriam Haskell. I don't know if you ever heard Miriam Haskell before. If you see anything from Miriam Haskell, uh, it's, it's stretch a, a lot of money as well on eBay um, because the intricate design and the material that Miriam Haskell used is really, really good quality for costume. And the third one is Trifari. But the people look for the older pieces from Trifari. So anything that was from the 1930s, uh, 40s, uh, especially the one that by designer Philip Alfred. And all Trifari items, by the way, they always have mark up to 2000. So after 2000, when the company was taken over by Liz Claiborne, they stopped making the marking. That's when the, the value is just plummeted. So anything below that, uh, Trifari is really good uh, brand that you want to, it's highly sick uh, after. Yeah. Yeah, Trifari was sold in the good department stores. Right. But the other two, where were they sold? Which also, one? The, you mentioned Juliana. Oh, Juliana and uh, Juliana closed its factory back in the 1980s. And also uh, Haskell, they, they, uh, they don't produce good quality anymore. I think you can still find some of them. I don't know where, could be Macy's, could be JCPenney. But the one that people look for collectibles was the one from the 1940s. Yeah. What about um, Monet? Monet is a mid-range designer, uh, means that they're not really collectibles. It's fun, it's really nice, but in terms of value, it's not much. Unless it's the one that made for runway, the one that uh, they make limited edition or a couple pieces, that could stretch a lot of money. Did they use any stones like Trifari or were they just all metal? They're all base metal, uh, except for Koro. Koro is one of the brand that back, back in the 1940s, some of them use sterling, but the rest just pretty much base metal. Uh, glass, uh, faux pearl, they don't use any precious stone. Yeah. So, any questions so far? If not, we're going to move to take care of your jewelry. So, uh, with... Uh, Precious metal, to take care of it, you, uh, you do not want to use uh, anything harsh. Uh, gold and silver, you can just use boil, uh, boil water, hot boil water. And if you have a tea strainer, put your jewelry inside there and just put in the boiling water and that's it. Or you can uh, scrub them with uh, a mild soap and uh, use a toothbrush. You don't want to go overboard with... Polishing cloth for silver is good, yeah, um, but you don't want to use any uh, harsh chemical. Uh, please do not wear your uh, gold or silver when you go swimming because the chlorine is really bad for, it's not bad for the gold. The gold is fine, but it will tarnish and discolor the alloy metal that mixed with the gold. Yeah, so it's not the gold itself. The gold is fine, but the, the combination of the, the metal that will uh, damage your uh, jewelry. Um, so if you want to, uh, if you have a vintage uh, sterling costume or vintage, the natural way you can use, you won't believe it or not, is banana peel. So, banana peel. So a peel of banana. Yeah. So you, all you got to do is just take a, you know, old toothbrush, rub it on the banana peel and start to use it on your silver or your... Uh, Custom jewelry, yeah. On the outside or the inside of the Yes, you can. Uh, it helped to keep the luster of it. The inside of the pill, right? Yeah, the inside of the pill, not the outer, the inside. Uh, also, I'm not endorsed by this company, but I love this brand so much. I use it for everything, for my copper, for my gold, for my silver. Uh, they used to sell this at Fantastic Indoor Market but they don't have it anymore. So you, what you can do is go online and you can get this one. This is really safe because what's in it is banana peel. <laughs> yes. What's the name? The name is uh, Glow Tech Inc. Yeah, this, this one is natural. So if you open it, it smells like banana peel. Yeah. So uh, quick question, when you use banana peel, 
Water yes, you, you might want to uh, uh, mix it with uh, warm water. Okay. It kind of like make it a paste to it and just kind of rub it. That's to just keep luster of your uh, silver. Yeah, it's one of the most natural thing you can do. And to keep it, you can uh, have a pouch that made out of felt or suede, something like this. Keep it separate for your precious metal because you don't want them to get scratched. You don't want them to get uh, damage from other pieces. So you want to make them really nice and save them away from the sun. You know, same thing. Sun always damage everything. Um, and that's that's it. You have any questions? Yes. I know you have pearls up there. Yes. How can you tell when it's a real pearl as opposed to a so. I brought this just in case we have time, but uh, uh, the boss already like, hey, you have only this much minute. So if you guys don't mind to hear the story of pearls, I can explain you explain it to you real quick. So basically, when you see pearls, you want to know is it real or not. There is a couple techniques to do it. Uh, again, you want to have a loop. This is your best friend when you hunt for jewelry or you want to find what's the worth of your jewelry. So you want to have the loop and you want to bend a little bit. Uh, your pearl pieces and you want to take a look real quick if the pearl has a, a chipped or peeled then it's painted or it's dipped it's not real pearl second you want to uh, take the pearl against the pearl same thing you use your teeth but I don't want to use my teeth so I'll just use pearl and pearl you kind of rub it together if you kind of feel the greediness or sandiness of it then it's real pearl it, I have the fake one right here, and I told my friend to kind of rub it earlier. It's soft. It's, it's slippery. This is a good indicator. It's not real. Yeah. There is a lot of techniques that I study, but this is the common techniques that I use. One of them is with the loop, and second is you rub them together and see if it's, you know, greedy or not. Uh, no. No, no, uh, okay, if it's a real expensive pearl, you don't want to do that. You want to bring to appraisal and say, hey, is this real or not? <laughs> if it's like you found it on garage sale, then you want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions about uh, jewelry, anything? Do the pearls have to be able to breathe? In other words, don't put it in a plastic? Yeah, the best thing to uh, uh, keep your pearl is wear it. Because your uh, regular oil in your body help to uh, polish or make the pearl last forever. Do not ever put them in the uh, boiling water. Please don't do that. Uh, just have a polished cloth that you can buy, uh, microfiber, anything soft. Polish them carefully to remove dirt. Uh, but other than that, you're good to go. If you want to kind of like wipe the dust, use a, a brush makeup, the fine uh, bristle one and just kind of like uh, wipe the dust. Pearl is very, very delicate uh, uh, jewelry that um, really uh, need re minim minimum uh, things to take care of. So yes? How often do you clean your jewelry? Now? How often? <laughs> I, I don't clean my jewelry, to be honest, <laughs> until I see, you know, it depends what kind of jewelry as well. If it's like this, it's just flat, uh, you know, bangle, you just kind of like polish it with the soft cloth. If it's something that you kept it and you never wear it and you want to kind of, like, okay, I want to wear it tonight for dinner, then you can start cleaning it. You know, there's really no minimum or maximum time. Yeah. It's just for your own pleasure. I like to clean it, so I want to clean it. Then you can do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. What's the blue stone? Oh, this one blue? is, yes. whoops. This is lapis lazuli from it Afghanistan. Is. The reason I brought here is because I want to show you the different class for a necklace, but I didn't realize it's only an hour class, <laughs> so we have very limited. <laughs> this is what they call it toggle clasp. Yeah, it's, it's quite safe, but uh, these days a lot of people really use a lobster clasp. Lobster is pretty much that looks like a lobster uh, feet. Yeah, like crawl like that. Yeah. When did the toggles start coming into use? Uh, 19, between 1940s to 1960s. Yeah. And this one is uh, Af now, now again with uh, gemstones. If somebody told you like, oh, this is, by the way, from uh, Burmese or whatever. The answer is you don't know that unless you have certification or provenance or origin letter. People can say anything from anywhere, but they don't know for sure. 
me as a jeweler uh, for fine jewelry, I don't even know unless we trust the suppliers, if that makes sense. But yeah, uh, according to the lady who sold this to me, she said it's from Afghan, Lapis Lazuli. So this is one of the uh, pieces that I love as well. Yes. Uh, how do you tell it's jade? Yeah, I mean, like, how do you know if it's real? Okay, uh, for jade, there is a couple things you can do. One, if it's a bangle, let's say this is, uh, just let's pretend this is jade. Uh, just put it right here, and then you, you take a piece of uh, coin, and you try to ping it. If it's a make a sound of ping, then it's real jade. If it's make a sound of like, then it's not jade. Yeah. There is a lot of fake uh, jade out there. Uh, they mistaken jade with Chris. Uh, they, sorry, they mistaken chrysophrase, which is another uh, kind of stone, with jade. They just say, "Oh, it's jade," because jade can be really expensive. But also, jade has different quality. Like, for example, this one I have here is jade, but this is lower quality. How do I know that? Because the color, color of jade, if it's higher quality, is going to be uh, emerald green. Yeah. <laughs> But there's also different colors of jade too. Yeah, there's also different color. There's a lavender jade. There is a blue jade. There is a, a black jade. Yeah, yeah. The other way, if you want to invest in uh, identifying your gemstone, is there. There's a machine called Presidium. It's a little expensive, but it's worth if you want to buy. The way it tested uh, different stone is by their uh, most scale, which is the hardness of it. So basically. It's kind of like a little pen that you can put on your uh, stone. It will show you what kind of stone they are. It could be jade, it could be topaz, could be uh, amethyst, quartz, uh, could be tourmaline. So if you are thinking to become a dealer or taking a serious business in the jewelry, it's a good investment to buy that machine. Yeah, uh, Presidium, P-R-E-S-I-D-I-U-M. <laughs> yes. Yeah, my, my place. <laughs> I mean, I get to know what I was like. So I work for... <laughs> huh? Okay, yeah. So I work for Michael E. Menden. I don't know if you ever heard the advertisement, Michael E. Menden. That's where I work part-time. And Michael, if you see this, <laughs> raise my <laughs> salary. <laughs> because, yeah, so Michael E. Menden is a really good uh, store because it's locally owned. Uh, I learn a lot uh, from that store. I learn... Uh, diamonds from one carat to five carats. I see it every day. I play with it, and then uh, they take your gold. Any anything you want to appraise, they can do it. Anything you want to check, they can do it as well. Yeah. We thank you guys all for coming. We're gonna hold all questions, uh, and we'll continue them in just a minute. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming in. Yeah. <laughs>